as we were singing this hymn, we saw a wonderful important connection in reference to God's church. That it is upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, her Lord. That there is one Lord, one faith, one birth. And partaking of one holy food. We often sing these words, but the practice of those words is often missing in many professed Christians. And so indeed, the theme of this divine service is our submission to God's church. From one Sabbath to another here, we have been spending a research into God's word in reference to righteousness by faith, which we have seen is righteousness by love. The, that obedience, righteousness, is to be motivated by nothing else but love that works. A faith that works by love. A love that is kindled by God giving his own son to save us wretched sinners. All that is involved there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. How are we going to cease from perishing if we are not obedient to God's way? It is through the meditation of the wonderful love of God in the detail of the atonement of Jesus Christ that our hearts are stirred into obedience. As it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. And so, so far in our divine services, we have addressed some points of obedience. Last Sabbath was regarding obedience to God's art of healing that he approves of. Before that time, it was the place where we worship to have reverence for God because we love him and the way that reverence is to be exercised in his house. During this divine service, we want to occupy our minds in God's word in reference to what he wants us, how he wants us to respond to his church. Submission to it. According to our scripture reading, what is the church? What was it there? First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Apostle Paul is writing there what we read to Timothy, hoping to come to Timothy shortly. But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Now, what is the house of God? What is God's church? Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church, God's house, is the pillar and ground of 
the truth. This church that is being spoken about here was established by Jesus Christ, the one who loved us so much that he sacrificed himself in the atonement. And he established the Christian church, the church of God, as one church. One church. I just want to let Jesus picture this for us in uh, Matthew chapter 28. Just to help us appreciate the encompassing uh, statement of Jesus here that there is one church, not many. Matthew 28. And there we read verses 18 through to 20. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. <clears throat> and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. What is Jesus saying here? First of all, all power is given unto me. All power is given unto me. And then he says, go ye therefore. What has he just done? The church is Christ's church. All power is in him. And now he says, you are therefore to go and teach all nations. Because the power that is given unto me, I am channeling to you to teach people to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And now comes the linkage. And lo, I am with you all way. How long for? Even unto the end of the world. What does that mean? The church that he was launching out there, the disciples, he was going to be with them right through to the end of the world. Does this not say something? That the church that he launched there is the church that's going to be right through to the end. The one church. The church that he has established. And I'm going to let inspiration really bring this point home. From the uh, book, Selected Messages, book three. And I'm reading there from page 18 in paragraph Two and three. This is a profound, beautiful connection of understanding what Jesus is saying. It says the prayer, the prayer of Christ is not only for those who are now his disciples, present tense as he was speaking to them, but for all those who shall believe on Christ through the words of his disciples, even 
to the end of the world. Jesus was just about to yield up his life to bring life and immortality to light. Christ, amid his sufferings and being daily rejected of men, looks down the lines 2,000 years to his church, which would be in existence in the last days before the close of this earth's history. In that one statement, he is visualizing down through the centuries, 2,000 years to the church that he said, I'm going to be with you in the end. That same church. I go on reading. The Lord has had a church from that day through all the changing scenes of time to the present time when Sister White wrote that, 1893. And for us now, 2022. He has seen his church. The Bible sets before us a model church. They are to be in unity with each other and with God. When believers are united to Christ, the living vine, the result is that they are one with Christ, full of sympathy and tenderness and love. What I have just been reading here is plain and simple. The church that Jesus launched out in the disciples must be the same church at the end. And that's the church that we are considering here that we must be in submission to. Mark the words of Jesus as he launched out this church in, Math in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. Remember he said, All power is given unto me, go ye therefore. Here is now Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19, which connects the power that he has with his church. Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. And he's speaking here because Simon Peter had said that he is the, the son of the living God and so on. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Jesus Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What has Jesus just done? He has just communicated that the church has the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And what the church does here on earth is directly in the, um, in the, in the functioning uh, activity of Jesus himself in, from heaven so that they become, as I'm going to read in a moment, the voice of God on earth. Follow carefully here, verse chapter 18, verse 18. He says it there once again. Verily I say unto you. And I love the way that he says that frequently. Verily. Really. Truly. I say unto you. 
Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Don't forget what's behind that statement. The church has been given from God, from heaven, the keys. They are relying on the keys that were given from heaven. And as they rely on those keys, whatever those, those keys are unlocking or locking is theirs to pursue because all power is given to the rock, Jesus Christ, upon which the church is built. And they are to fulfill what the kingdom of heaven is directing. I want the spirit of prophecy to give us a clear understanding of what is here contained in these words of Jesus. I go there to Testimony, Volume 7, page 263, paragraph 3. Sister White just quoted what we were reading here. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and so on. It says, this statement holds its force in all ages. Just as we were reading, I'm with you, with the church, right to the end, in all ages. This statement holds its force in all ages. On the church has been conferred the power to act in Christ's stead. To the church has been given the power to act in Christ's stead. It is God's instrumentality for the preservation of order and discipline among his people. Mark every word. The church is God's instrumentality for the preservation of order and discipline among his people. To it, the Lord has delegated the power to settle all questions respecting its prosperity, purity, and order. Upon it rests the responsibility of excluding from its fellowship those who are unworthy, who by their unchrist-like conduct would bring dishonor on the truth. Whatever the church does that is in accordance a very, very uh, qualifying statement here. Whatever the church does that is in accordance with the directions given in God's word will be ratified in heaven. You can see that the keys of opening and shutting and, and doing all those works that Jesus told them to do is dependent upon the church being in perfect connection with Christ. And I want to read in Testimony, Volume 3, in, to connect that. Testimony, Volume 3, page 428, and paragraph 1, it says this. The world's Redeemer has invested great power with his church. He states the rules to be applied in cases of trial with its members. After he has given explicit directions as to the course to be pursued, he says, huh? so explicit directions that they were to follow, he says, Verily I say unto you, 
Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever in the church discipline you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Thus, even the heavenly authority ratifies the discipline of the church in regards to its members when the Bible rule has been followed. So for the church to have power to do this, it must follow what God has directed the church to do. Then what they bind on earth is bound in heaven because in heaven God is directing. And this is an, an, an interesting exercise of mind here that it will be bound in heaven what is bound on earth. How is that? Let's read it. Because the church on earth is inseparably connected to the church in heaven. Let's go and read it there in Hebrews 12. That when we come to God's church that he has established, we, are, we come where? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 and 23. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable, com innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. That's where we approach the church, the church in heaven. The general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. That's the church, the church in heaven which the church on earth, that we come to in the visible church on earth, we come through that church to the church in heaven. To have our names on the church books, we must make sure that our names are in the church books of heaven. And I just want to really bring that this word of God, bring this point home. The Spirit of Prophecy here in Testimony, Volume 6, <clears throat> page 366, paragraph 1. Here it is, all beautifully summarized. The church of God below is one with the church of God above. Believers on the earth and the beings in heaven who have never fallen, constitute one church. Every heavenly intelligence is interested in the assemblies of the saints who on earth meet to worship God. In the inner court of heaven, they listen to the testimony of the witnesses for Christ in the outer court on earth. And the praise and thanksgiving from the worshippers below is taken up in the heavenly anthem and praise and rejoicing sound through the heavenly courts because Christ has not died in vain for the fallen sons of Adam. Reading carefully, meditating upon these words, what does it say? God has only got one church. The church on earth that is in harmony with the church in heaven. That is one church. That's what I read there. Believers on earth and beings in heaven have, who have never fallen constitute one church. And the meditation of this hour is submission to God's church. That one church. So, as we come through from the time of Christ, as we've already read, 
that he is with them till the end of the world, what is that church with such power at the end of the world? That one church. Now, it's very important that we establish our understanding here, not from our own conclusions, but the conclusions that inspiration is making for us. And I'm reading it now in answer to this question, what is that church that has such a power on earth? What is that church? Let's come here to a quote from Acts of the Apostles, page 11, paragraph 2 through to 12, paragraph 1. This is about three or four paragraphs. It says here in Acts of the Apostles, page 11, paragraph 2 onward. It says, The church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Any betrayal of the church is treachery to him who has bought mankind with the blood of his only begotten son. See how beautifully this is all linked together? The love-motivated worship because he has given his only begotten son. Now here it is. From the beginning. What is the church that's got this power? From the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. This is the church, the faithful souls. In every age, the Lord has had his watchmen who have borne a faithful testimony to the generation in which they lived. These sentinels gave the message of warning, and when they were called to lay off their armor, others took up the work. God brought these witnesses into covenant relation with himself, uniting the church on earth with the church in heaven. Here it is again. He has sent forth his angels to minister to his church and the gates of hell have not been able to prevail against his people. Through centuries of persecution, conflict and darkness, God has sustained his church. Not one cloud has fallen upon it that he has not prepared for. Not one opposing force has risen to counterwork his work that he has not foreseen. All has taken place as he predicted. He has not left his church forsaken but has traced in prophetic declarations what would occur and that which his spirit inspired the prophets to foretell has been brought about. All his purposes will be fulfilled. His law is linked with his throne and no power of evil can destroy it. Truth is inspired and guarded by God and it will triumph over all opposition. You can see how powerfully these words are connecting God's immutable power of control through his church that is identified as the one church running right through the history. It goes on to say, during ages of spiritual darkness, the church of God has been as a city set on a hill. Now notice, from age to age, through successive generations, the pure doctrines of heaven have been unfolding within its borders. Enfeebled and defective, as it may appear, 
that church is the one object upon which God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. It is the theatre of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. The theatre is not the, the theatre where you see acting taking place, it's the theatre of, of operation where God is operating in the church. So what I've just been reading here tells us that it is the church of faithful people who have down through the ages been under God's direction and the gates of hell have not prevailed against it in which the pure doctrines of heaven have been unfolding within its borders. So the pure doctrines are connected with God's faithful church down through the ages to the very end when, where he says, I'm going to be with you at the end. So at this time, there is a church that is the same church that Jesus launched out in the beginning. And I want to just let again the spirit of prophecy identify this church that weak and enfeebled as it may appear. Remember I read that? Weak and enfeebled. This is not a glorious, beautiful, big church with lots of people in it. Weak and enfeebled as it may appear. I want to read from Upward Look, page 315. And here it is, the connection that the spirit of prophecy makes in contrast to the big in institutional churches that exist today and God's true faithful people, the true church. Upward look, page 315, paragraph 5 and 6. God has a church. God has a church. We've identified what she is. It is not. So what isn't it? It is not the great cathedral. Neither is it the national establishment. Neither is it the various denominations. It is the people who love God and keep his commandments. Where to? or three are gathered together in my name, says Jesus, there am I in the midst of them. He's connecting who as his church to himself? Where two or three are gathered, who are keeping his commandments, etc. Where Christ is, even among the humble few, this is Christ's church, for the presence of the High and Holy One who inhabiteth eternity can alone constitute a church. Where two or three are present who love and obey the commandments of God, Jesus there presides. Let it be in the desolate place of the earth, in the wilderness, in the city and closed in prison walls. The glory of God has penetrated the prison walls, flooding with glorious beams of heavenly light, the darkest dungeon. His saints may suffer, but their sufferings will be like the apostles of old. Spread their faith. Will the, their sufferings will, like the apostles of old, spread their faith, and win souls to Christ and glorify his holy name. The bitterest opposition expressed by those who hate God's great moral standard of righteousness should not and will not shake the steadfast soul who trusts fully in God. I must read the next paragraph. They that will be doers of the word are building securely 
and the tempest and storm of persecution will not shake their foundation because their souls are rooted to the eternal rock. It is this church, this little number, not the great cathedral, not the many denominations that exist today that he said, I'm going to be with you till the end of the world. It's that church that has run through the history that he has foreseen right through the 2,000 years. Now, in reference to this people, look at the power that is described in such a little company as Sister White describes it here in Testimony, Volume 5, page 119, where she says in paragraph 1, ten members, ten members, who are walking in all humbleness of mind would have a far greater power upon the world than has the entire church with its present numbers and lack of unity. The more there is of the divided, inharmonious element, the less power will the church have for good in the world. Aren't we seeing the divided state of Seventh-day Adventism today? Just look at it. It's not them. It's not them. Various denominations and Seventh Day Adventist Church of today is a denomination, and so you have all these different denominations. This is not the church, as we read that. It is the faithful people who are bound to the rock, Christ Jesus. It is these people, even if it's just ten. And now follow very carefully because what is the theme of this sermon? Submission to God's church. Follow very carefully Christ's connection of these faithful few to himself, with himself. Let's read Luke chapter 10. This is what he says. This is his words not any human opinion. Luke chapter 10, verse 16. What does Jesus say? He says, He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. What is this saying? The church that Jesus anointed as his church through to the very end, anybody that hears that church is hearing him. In other words, that church is his voice, isn't it? And he who despises this church despises him. And who else does, do they despise? The very God who sent him. I want to read again from the Spirit of Prophecy to let this point come home. Because we live in this strange religious society of today where people that are claiming to be followers of God and of Jesus Christ are actually despising Jesus, are actually despising God unwittingly. I want to read from Testimony, Volume 3, page 450, paragraph 2 and 3. In reference to those words, he who heareth you heareth me. When Christ was upon the earth, 
When Christ was upon the earth, there were men who had no respect or reverence for God's messengers and no more regard for their warning than for their own than for their own judgment people's own judgment also in now notice as it was back there also in this age of the world there are those who do not respect the testimony of God's chosen servants so highly as their own opinions. Are you picking something up? We have strong opinions about what we believe. But God's chosen servants are disrespected by their own opinions. It goes on, such cannot be benefited. Those who are are highly holding on to their own opinions. Such cannot be benefited by the labors of God's servants. And the time should not be lost. Wow, listen to this. And the time should not be lost in degrading the work of God to meet such minds. Minds that are full of their own opinion of what God is saying. Christ said to the servants whom he sent forth, He that heareth you, heareth me, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me, and he that despiseth me, despises him that sent me. Christ gives power to the voice of the church. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Which we quoted before goes on to say, no such thing is countenanced as one man starting out upon his own individual responsibility and advocating what views he chooses, irrespective of the judgment of the church. Don't we see this today? People put forth their own individual views, irrespective of the judgment of the church. God has bestowed the highest power under heaven upon his church. It is the voice of God in his united people in church capacity, which is to be respected which is to be respected. How powerful is that? You know, we read the spirit of prophecy sometimes and we wonder. We can't see what is written here in regards to the church because we're looking in the wrong place. So, in the light of all that I have read to you here, this has been my choice. This has been my choice. And I'm laying this out before you right now for you, each one of us, to make our choice because we are living in the time that we have to make choices in harmony with God's will. Very, very important at this time. As what I've just been reading, we, what did I read there? That there are men who had no respect or reverence for God's messengers in the past, in Christ's time, And also in this age of the world, there are those who do not respect the testimony of God's chosen servants so highly as their own opinions. We are living in a in a point of in a time of Christians discussing together and putting forth their own opinions. They don't like to be 
subjected to a direction from God, from the church. They don't like that. So it goes on to say that I mentioned here that that these people cannot be benefited by the labors of God's servants and time should not be lost in degrading the work of God to meet their minds. That no such thing is countenanced as one man's starting out upon his own individual responsibility and advocating what views he chooses irrespective of the judgment of the church. When I came across this, what I'm sharing with you here, I decided something. I decided that I will lay down every part of my own opinion and place my opinion and my understanding under those who have been clearly identified as God's church, under inspiration. And I had to swallow hard. I had to let go of opinions of my own, of my own practices. I had to alter because I've just read to you that which I have had to decide upon and each one of us have to come to that point of entire submission to God's church. The church that I described in reading Acts of the Apostles, page 12, paragraph 1. What was it there? The church that within its borders the pure doctrines of heaven had been establishing. So we are living now at the very end and is there any doctrine that still needs to be established? Jesus could have come long before this because the doctrines were all established. But God's people were not submissive to all those doctrines. That was the problem, so he's waiting. The challenge before each one of us, as it is and was before me, is that my love for God, that he aroused by demonstrating his love for me in giving his son in the, an atonement for me. That love activated within me to make a choice to unite and submit myself to those whom he has chosen as his servants to live in unity with them. God's servants have been ordained like the apostles down through the ages, the faithful ones, even if there's just ten of them. doesn't matter how few. He has chosen these servants to be the people who have the power to tell us what to do. Now, I'm not raising popery here. I am pointing to the church that is in absolute harmony with all of God's doctrines. And I found myself to examine the churches and I found that in my time, the church that I grew up in and the churches that surrounded me and all the different companies that surrounded me, they were out of order in one point or another with those whom God had established from 1844 through to 1904, and I made a decision to submit myself to their public presentation. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, 
Hebrews chapter 13, sorry, verse 17. What does it say here? Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Our submission to God's church. There are few today who actually do this, who have made the choice to obey, even if it cuts across their own opinion, to obey that which has been firmly established by God's true church in, in which borders the pure doctrines have developed. And so I ask you, with all the confusion of this church, that church, and we're moving from one church to another, think carefully here. What is your love and response to God and his church? Let us do what Apostle Paul invites us to do. In closing, I want to read a few closing scriptures here. Apostle Paul was a person who has been called directly from, by Jesus. And look at what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Uh, a human being is saying, you be followers of me. Why? Let's go to chapter 11. And there he qualifies very powerfully. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. the church on earth, his servants, can say, like Apostle Paul, you follow me as I follow Christ. And that's what the Apostle John referred to. But before we go to Apostle John, remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 17, that his prayer for his church is beautifully described expressed here in John chapter 17, and the unity of his servants with him. John 17 there, verses uh, 20. <laughs> Again, he's praying for his church. In verse 19, for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Believe on Jesus through what? Through the words of the faithful church. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Even if there's only ten people, even if there's only two or three here and two or three somewhere else, the world is to see a unity 
with those who've gone before and those among each other, as Jesus is prayed for. And the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, is simply saying what Apostle Paul said, be ye follower of me as I am follower of Christ. Let's answer the prayer of Jesus, John, 1 John 1, verse 1 to 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and which was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. There it is. He who despises John, who despises the Apostle Paul, is despising Jesus because those that are following the witness of these faithful ministers are in fellowship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ, as they were. Here is God's word for us. We all need to examine where I stand. If I believe in the work of righteousness by faith, then I will submit myself to the church that Jesus identifies as his church.